So this is a quasi response video to Turd Flinging Monkey's response video. I know it's a little belated, but due to my current work schedule, this is the first chance I've had to make a video. Now, I think it needs to be stated from the outset that I have no beef with TFM. The fact is that we agree on more things than we disagree. Actually, having spoken with the guy a couple of times now, it's dawned on me that even the things we appear to superficially disagree on are largely issues of semantics. For instance, TFM himself has admitted that whilst repeal the 19th makes for a nice internet slogan, it's unlikely to actually happen in real life. When he talks about the need to take away women's rights, he's using the phrase somewhat metaphorically to mean, as an individual man, don't be a cuck who lets women walk all over you. You should be in control of your own life. The authority is in your hands, so don't give her jack shit. Keep your pimp hand strong and put her in her place if she tries to manipulate you. In other words, it's not too dissimilar to my position that individual men need to start holding the adult women in their lives accountable for the consequences of their actions. We use different terminology, but at the end of the day, TFM and I are more or less on the same page talking about the same shit, just from slightly different perspectives. So the point of this video is not to drag things out into an embittered back and forth exchange, but in his video, TFM did raise a few points which I think are worth addressing. Before we get into his main objections to the overall thesis of my video, I just want to address two minor points first. This is this actually goes back to this the beginning opening argument that Colt makes in his video that Google didn't do nothing and that they're they're just basically going along with the cultural zeitgeist. I did not say this. I never said that Google didn't do nothing. I explicitly said that I do not like or approve of what Google are doing. However, I made the case that the corporate family-friendly actions of Google Incorporated actions which many conservative individuals are obsessively focused on are actually a symptom of a larger human behavioral problem rather than Google at all being the underlying root cause of our current socio-political issues. Taking action against Google at this point, like breaking it up into a collection of smaller companies that have less power, isn't necessarily going to roll back the climate of political correctness that led to the so-called adpocalypse or deplatforming of people like Alex Jones in the first place. Secondly, his premise is that the banks are going to say no to women, like the banks are going to be the ones who put the brakes on. And if you look at the housing bailouts in 2008, like when Obama was president, he did this whole like mortgage renegotiation program. Now, the people who bought all these loans they couldn't afford through subprime lending and shit like that, they weren't victims. They were just greedy pieces of shit who took loans they couldn't afford because uh, they thought like houses were free money. But when push comes to shove, people always cry to the government. And because the government has a political incentive, if enough people cry to the government, they will take action. So the banks could say no all day. The government will say yes. Okay, I am not necessarily saying that the banks will be our blessed saviors. I am not saying that we should just blindly trust in the banks and all of our problems will be magically solved. I was simply saying that in a modern world of zero consequences, the banks seem to be the last large-scale social institution still holding individual people, including to women's, to some degree of accountability. There may be legal changes in future, credit history and limits may be expressed in different ways, and in dire times, governments may still bail out irresponsible dumb fucks. But the banking institutions themselves, as, as long as banks exist to turn a profit, as long as their primary business is lending money with the expectation of a safe return on investment, I don't really see this individual accountability on the part of banks going away anytime soon. In terms of pragmatic solutions at a societal level, banks certainly aren't everything, but their influence isn't nothing either. With those two minor points out of the way, TFM's main objection to my video seems to stem from the economic concept of revealed preferences. In other words, the disparity between what people say they want versus what people are actually spending their money on in an open marketplace. The point that Coltane was trying to make that, you know, the average person is basically cipher. They've chosen the blue pill. 
But I don't think that's true. And how do I know that's not true? It's because the marriage rate is dog shit. MGTOW is a thing. Men aren't getting... It's not just MGTOW. Like, men aren't getting married. P people are reacting to Me Too. You have uh, men avoiding women, men not getting married. Why is there a disparity between their stated preferences or their stated responses in these surveys and their actions? This is a phenomenon in economics known as revealed preferences. So in economics, you have people say a lot of shit. Uh, the reason why... Actually, let me back up. The reason why economics studies money is because money is a great way to reveal what people actually believe. Like, you know the expression, put your money where your mouth is? That's where that comes from. And what you see is while men can say they uh, they have no problem with feminism, feminism's great, women have just the right amount of rights, what you actually observe in their behavior doesn't match that. They're not getting married. They're not, uh, you know, they're avoiding women. They're doing the Mike Pence rule. They're doing the you know, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Now, TFM is not entirely wrong here. Some men are waking up, but this is a numbers game, people, and I'm sorry, but going by all the available data, men are not waking up at a rate that even comes close to being a meaningful interruption to the broad socio-political direction that our 21st century civilization is taking. I don't see our current trajectory changing. Things are going to get a whole lot worse for men before they get better if things can even get better at all, without ditching all of the world-altering technology that got us into this situation in the first place. Some men, some very small subset of men like MGTOW may be dropping out, but as I said, MGTOW is the exception to the rule. We are the statistical outliers to this societal norm. It would be an enormous mistake to look at our dark little corner of the internet and extrapolate that to the rest of mainstream society. Pointing to the existence of MGTOW as proof that society is breaking down is like pointing to suicides as evidence that there is no innate biological drive towards self-preservation. Yes, it does happen, but it is not the norm. When talking about the critical mass required to change society, men, the overwhelming majority of men, the numbers of men that actually count, those men are not avoiding women. They are not ghosting. They are still pursuing relationships. They are still getting married. They are still having children. For all of our talk here about inherent female nature and the erosion of legal due process, the Mike Pence rule is not even a consideration which enters the minds of most men when they step into an elevator at work. Unfortunately, they are probably thinking about the Mike Pence rule even less when it actually matters most. When that cute brunette from two cubicles over starts flirting and throwing out fuck me eyes, trying to manipulate Joe Cuck with the subtle unspoken innuendo that something sexual might happen if he does her work for her, he is not consciously thinking, well shit, this could blow up in my face and lead to a career ending accusation if I'm not careful. No, he is thinking, by golly, I've won the lottery, I might actually get my dick wet. When all the blood is rushing to his cock instead of his brain, the average man just isn't seriously considering his future. As I said in my last video, trying to save the blue pill masses from themselves is a fruitless exercise in futility, because the average blue pill man is a smooth-brained moron running on evolutionary autopilot primarily driven by his instinctual desire to stick his cock into a slippery meat hole. After getting past all of the obligatory are you gay questioning, most average men with whom I discuss my views on women, reproductive biology, sexual behavior, and modern relationships still ultimately conclude that I am just sad, bitter, jaded, haven't found the right woman yet, and so on. The average blue pill man doesn't want to be saved. He does not want to hear about the real dangers of modern relationships. He just wants to live out his happily ever after fantasy. You can cite all the statistics in the world, it doesn't matter. In his head, there is a narwhal out there for everyone, and you're just a bitter virgin loser if you do anything to disrupt this Disney-esque fairy tale. They don't want to be hearing words like hypergamy come out of your mouth. Again, 
I think this may be a case of people getting wrapped up in their own little corner of the internet. All of us here know that marriage is a giant shit sandwich. We fucking know it, but it would be an absolutely colossal mistake to assume that our understanding and our values are shared by the majority of other people who make up society. To the extent that the average man on the street may have some reservations about modern marriage, you know, some vague suspicion that putting a ring on it may not turn out to be such a good deal for him long term, when it actually matters most, the average man on the street certainly doesn't seem to be acting upon that suspicion or applying any red pill knowledge which may be rattling around in the back of his head. I mean, really, let's have a look and see what these revealed preferences actually show us about marriage. Fewer young people say I do to any relationship. As the shocking headline suggests, over the decade covered, the marriage rate has gone down dramatically in the 18 to 29 age category. However, this seems to be a result of young people casually dating for longer and settling down into marriage later, rather than a general rejection of marriage or wholesale avoidance of long-term relationships. As I pointed out in my original video, which TFM was responding to, a 75% majority, that is three quarters of all Americans, will have married at least once by age 35. And that is actual traditional marriage. If we scroll down on that Gallup page and look at the 30 to 39 age category, we see that whilst the traditional marriage rate has slightly fallen, the comparative rate of non-traditional de facto cohabitation has almost doubled over that same time period. As an aside, this differs depending on jurisdiction, but in my country, these de facto couples are seen as legally married in the eyes of the law. If you have a relationship with a woman lasting 24 months, she can up and take half your shit regardless of whether you actually signed a contract or not. Marriage rates have fallen, but de facto relationships have subsequently risen. Looking at this graph, over the decade examined, the demographic category that we would typically refer to as single, never married, has only risen by about 4%. The fact is that whilst people today find the tradition less important than the people of yesteryear, the overwhelming majority of Americans still want to get married. The category of people who are single and say that they never, ever want to be married represents less than 10% of the population. Even within the most extreme 18 to 34 age category, a demographic who, quite frankly, are rather prone to changing their minds as they age. In addition to this continued desire for marriage, the overwhelming majority of Americans also still want children, and the average ideal number of children that they desire is still well above replenishment at 2.6 children per couple, a statistic which has held relatively steady for the last five decades. This, I think, is where the concept of revealed preferences really starts to break down. Revealed preferences have a great deal of explanatory power in some areas. For instance, feminists will complain that violent porn is warping the minds of young men, teaching them to be abusive towards women. However, Google Analytics data has revealed that the majority of violent porn is actually watched by women, not men. This is important information to have. It shows us that what women say they want and what they actively choose to consume in private it are two very different things. However, like most other areas of scientific extrapolation, I would be very cautious about relying on revealed preferences to prove a negative. For example, the fact that home ownership has declined over the last 25 years in Australia doesn't necessarily mean that Australians no longer hold a preference to own their own property. The trend could well be driven by economic pressures outside of their control. Wage increases over the last 25 years have been barely kept up with inflation at about 2.3% per annum. Whilst over that same time period, Australian property prices have increased at a rate more than double that at 6.8% per annum for houses and 5.9% per annum for apartments. 
Showing that women secretly have a preference to actively consume violent pornography is a very different proposition compared with the negative extrapolation that falling home ownership rates therefore proves people no longer hold a preference towards owning their own homes. You really can't make that logical leap. People may still prefer to own their own homes, but they can no longer express that preference because the economic barrier to entry has risen so much in comparison to their wage. The downturn in home ownership may not actually reveal anything meaningful about the average person's underlying preferences or beliefs. Likewise, according to Investopedia, the average cost of raising a child in America today is somewhere in the ballpark of $230,000 US dollars. In a household which earns $40,000, the baby's first year will run you up a bill to the tune of about $21,000. More than half of your yearly household earnings is no small investment. People are waiting longer to get married and ultimately having fewer children, but I would be extremely cautious about actually extrapolating this negative data to say anything definitive or meaningful about the underlying preferences, mindset or beliefs of blue pill men. When average blue pill normies tell Gallup that they still hold a strong preference to marry and have children, I would tend to believe them. Like home ownership, modern economic pressures have altered the feasibility and dynamics of reproductive relationships, but based on all the data we have available, the actual desired preferences that people hold for marriage and children really haven't changed all that much over the last few decades. Even many self-professed MGTOW men that I've encountered online are effectively on marriage strike. They don't particularly care about the fixed state of sexually dimorphic biology which underlies the problems inherent in these modern human reproductive relationships. No, these supposed MGTOW men would still prefer to get married and have kids if it weren't for Karl Marx gone done tricked all the lady folk into being angry feminazis. If only we could ever so slightly renegotiate that superficial legal contract called marriage, then we can all just cipher our way back into the matrix and live out our happy little lie as wage slaves as if nothing ever happened. I have had a number of supposedly red pill men tell me that, you know, men have always been expected to go down with the ship, but at least they used to be respected for it. Fuck that. Respect is useless to a dead man. If you think trading your life for the respect of some woman on a life raft you've never even met is a fair deal, then you are a fucking idiot. Even if she was pregnant with your child, I still don't see that it would be worth it. You can get another wife, you can make another baby, but you don't don't get any do-overs once you're dead. I've literally lost count of the comments left on my videos saying shit like, lucky I married a unicorn then. No. No you fucking didn't. Every man thinks that his girlfriend or his wife is a narwhal, but she's not. Stardust recently made a great little video looking at the crude divorce rates of different countries, essentially debunking the long-standing myth of the loyal traditional Eastern European woman. And the same thing applies to the equally mythical unicorns of the Far East, where even Thailand has hit a divorce rate of 40%, or China, where more than 70% of divorces are initiated by women. There is no such thing as a narwhal. All women are like that. All women are women. They all operate on the same underlying set of biological reproductive impulses. She isn't a fucking narwhal. She just hasn't been presented with a good enough reason or opportunity to monkey branch on you yet. But mark my words, things can change in an instant. If you get seriously injured or lose your job, then just wait and see how long that loyalty lasts. The fact is that female spousal disloyalty is so prevalent prevalent and predictable that we have literally developed common shorthand language to describe it like Dear John letters. You're off fighting for your country, but, you know, she needs her fill of Chadcock. Many unsuspecting men have stood up in front of friends and family and said, I do, because she's the one, only to find out the hard way that all women are narwhal unicorns until they are suddenly not anymore. And this, marriage renegotiation, dying for respect, 
respect and belief in Far Eastern unicorns, this is the mentality of many men who call themselves red pilled or MGTOW. These are the guys who supposedly get it. As the fabled saying goes, most red pill men are just one blowjob away from heading back to the plantation. And as for those men who don't get it, the average blue pilled smooth brain seems more than happy to keep on getting married. Then they get divorce raped, and then they get remarried and do it all over again. Two thirds of divorced men said that they either actively wanted to remarry or were at the very least not opposed to the idea. And according to the statistics across all age ranges, half of these divorcees do go on to remarry. Whilst remarriage was down in younger categories owing to factors we've already discussed, divorcees in the 55 and over age demographic are actually more likely to remarry today than they were in the 1960s. These are men who have already Already been through the meat grinder of the family court system and they just can't wait to line up and do it all over again. The median amount of time that it takes for someone to get remarried after a divorce is only 3.7 years, a statistic which has apparently been fairly stable since the 1950s. So it's hardly surprising that almost a third of all new marriages in the US involve at least one person who has been previously married. People should know better, especially when they have personally been fucked over once already, but apparently they do not learn from their mistakes. They will keep getting married even after they have been divorce raped once already. In fact, according to the statistics, these men who have been divorce raped are twice as likely to show a preference for remarriage than the very women who pulled the trigger on them. They just don't learn even from direct experience. Like I said, it is tempting for us to get wrapped up in our own little corner of the internet here. I know it is tempting to look at MGTOW and all the news stories and statistics we cover and reasonably conclude that marriage must be failing. It is a mistake because most people are not reasonable. Even if they are delaying it later than they used to, the overwhelming majority of Americans will still marry. And according to the survey statistics, those left unmarried aren't necessarily avoiding marriage by preferential choice. Men who are consciously going their own way, particularly those who are going their own way for the right reasons, make up an impossibly small percentage of the general population. And for that matter, so do the screeching post-war feminist cat ladies. Don't get me wrong, they are certainly a vocal minority, but to the extent that average women of marriageable age may be disappointed by their available options, the majority are still choosing to settle. Even if she's simply biding her time until she can monkey branch to a better option, she is still engaging in long-term relationships. Fact, Americans are still overwhelmingly in favour of marriage and children, and to the extent that some minority of Americans have turned against the traditional institution, they seem to be turning towards less traditional de facto cohabitation, rather than rejecting long-term relationships and female-centric family units entirely. I really don't see things changing because frankly, I don't see men changing. The majority of men are weak-willed pussy beggars who will go along with whatever women want in the vain hopes that supplication will ultimately get them what they want. Only 12% of American men think that feminism has gone too far. TFM tried to hand wave this statistic away by suggesting that it was just virtue signaling. Uh, the other thing you gotta keep in mind is people will say shit that they don't actually mean in order to try to conform to the group. This is called uh, virtue signaling. I don't know if you've heard this. So virtue signaling is when people say shit they don't actually mean to try to appear virtuous to the public. Th that survey showing that only 12% of men aren't, uh, you know, aren't feminist o overtly isn't that they actually believe it. It's that they're unwilling to stand up and take women's rights away. If you're unwilling to answer a survey honestly, you're clearly not going to take women's rights away. Because answering a survey... Yeah, you might be risking some social ostracization, but rising up to take women's rights away, that's a pretty high standard. That doesn't mean they actually support feminism. Otherwise, the marriage rate wouldn't be shit. You know, you wouldn't see all these articles about where are all the good men. Uh, you know, why is no one getting married? Why am I single at 35? You know, like, those articles wouldn't happen. If nobody had a problem with feminism, if we're all A-OK, -okay, 
Uh, you wouldn't have the Mike Pence rule. You wouldn't have people stop hiring women. Clearly, men have a problem with feminism. Even hypothetically accepting that explanation, I don't think it would actually improve the situation at all. I mean, really, think about the consequences of what that would mean. According to the Pew Research poll, only 18% of right-wing Republican voters think that feminism has gone too far. If TFM's counterpoint is correct, it would essentially mean that 82%, or a four-fifths majority of right-wing Republicans, are perfectly happy to throw their own political principles under the bus just so that they can virtue signal to Pew Research in an anonymous survey. Think about that. Has feminism gone too far? Frankly, it doesn't really matter whether these Republicans believe what they are saying or not because the alternative suggested by TFM here has the same real-world outcome. As a viable political opposition to social justice feminism, the mainstream political right wing is functionally useless. And so are mainstream men. I work with a lot of tough, blue-collar, traditionalist, right-wing conservative men. At work, they all talk a big game about being the man of the house and the the wife ironing their shirts and cooking and cleaning for them, then whenever I see them together as a couple, it's always yes miss, no miss, three bags full miss. When the time comes that it actually matters, I have seen these same traditional blue collar strong men instantly transform into weak emotional cripples who meekly follow any instruction that their wife gives them. I literally know some guys who will work 50, 60 hours a week to pay the bills and then their wife, their stay-at-home fucking wife, will meter them out a certain amount of weekly spending money. Good boy, here's some pocket money, don't go spending it all at once. Supplication for sex. By my estimation, the distance in reproductive strategy between blue pill traditional men and the sniveling male feminist soy boys really isn't as large as you might first think. But I digress. If revealed preferences do matter, then what does this tell us? I honestly don't know what these men truly believe. Maybe they were all just virtue signaling to Pew Research. Maybe they do all secretly believe that female empowerment has gone too far. But what does that secret belief matter if they're all too scared to actually do anything about it, even when dealing with their own wives in their own fucking homes that they are working 60 hours a week to pay for? Whether they secretly believe it or not is irrelevant because their publicly stated beliefs and the actual outcomes of their actions are in complete synergy. I really do wish that I had some better news for you guys, but the facts, the actual available data really doesn't look so good. Everything seems to show that society is running on reproductive cruise control and the impact that small groups of separatist men like MGTOW are making doesn't even count as ripples in the water. Here is the problem with all of this, my problem with the fundamental position held by Mr. TF Monkey and many others that male responsibility needs to be balanced by male authority. My problem is that from what I can see, it has yet to be established that male authority as a system, aka patriarchy, ever really existed in the first place. Patriarchy is not a natural social framework. What do I mean by that? I mean that it does not appear anywhere in nature. Off the top of my head, I cannot think of a single species, particularly higher order social animals, where all males of the species hold systematic authority over all females of the species. You see, social animals tend to fall into one of two reproductive categories, pair bonding species and tournament species. And there are some big implications in how these species structure their social hierarchies around these two reproductive models. As this article notes in its introduction, most Most species living in groups composed of multiple males and multiple females are promiscuous, whilst most pair bonded species live in groups comprised of only one male and one female. The major exception to this appears to be human beings. Human beings do live in large groups composed of multiple males and females, but they pair bond. However, this human exception only seems to exist under a very specific set of circumstances. Human beings show all the hallmarks 
hallmarks of being a tournament species. High levels of sexual dimorphism, male dominance competition, and for the majority of their evolutionary history, human beings have engaged in the same tournament-style mating practices seen in their closest primate relatives. It has only been a relatively short period, evolutionarily speaking, that human beings have engaged in lifelong monogamous pair bonding, mainly owing to the survival pressures of post-agrarian economics. Long-term monogamy is extremely rare in the animal kingdom. Only 3% to 5% of the roughly 5,000 species of mammals, including humans, are known to form lifelong monogamous bonds. And anthropologists estimate that even today, only about 17% of all human cultures could be categorized as strictly monogamous. I think it would be most accurate to say that humans are reproductively opportunistic. They will engage in monogamous pair bonding when they have to. For instance, when a free market economy forces a high degree of individual survival responsibility. If you can't pay your rent, then your ass is out on the street. If you can't afford food, then you starve. And women, by and large, could not adequately compete in this free market because for most of human civilization, economic progress was primarily driven by hard manual labor. So given the circumstances, a woman would pair bond with a man for a one-on-one -on -one transactional relationship of sexual reproduction in exchange for resource provisioning within this individualistic economy. A woman will settle for a man when she has to. And that has been the state of things throughout most of our recorded history, i.e. the duration of this experimental group survival strategy we call civilization, which has led us to the mistaken sample biased conclusion that this is how things have always been, that this is how things naturally are for the human ape. But this lifelong monogamous pair bonding is certainly not the natural reproductive model of the human ape. It is not what humans naturally evolved to do, it is not how they naturally evolved to behave in the wild. When we look at modern day hunter-gatherers essentially free from these artificial economic constraints, what we see is an extremely collectivist, polygonous social model structured into four distinct groups. Women, children, alpha males, and beta males. The women all want to reproduce with the top alphas, the top tribesmen, top hunters, top warriors, who will often take anywhere up to three or four wives. The women also engage in allo parenting, wherein the children are collectively raised by the female half of the tribe. This is why primitive human cultures all have coming of age ceremonies. This ceremony signifies the time that the boy leaves the female side of the tribe as a child to join the male side of the tribe as a man. Even the language of these tribes reflects this social model. The kinship system of Australian Aboriginals is quite complicated, and unless you're familiar with it, you may not know exactly which relative is being talked about, because Aboriginal people often refer to aunties and uncles as mothers and fathers. They will often refer to cousins as brothers and sisters. In these tribes which practice allo parenting, the distinction between immediate and extended family is extremely blurred because the children are in many ways seen as collectively belonging to the tribe rather than belonging to a specific pair of genetic parents. In primitive hunter-gatherer cultures, reproduction is effectively collectivized, which of course brings us to the beta males, the majority of males who collectively support the tribe and benefit in terms of a group survival strategy, but rarely see any direct reproductive success themselves. Just do the maths. Assuming roughly equal numbers of men and women, for every top warrior or hunter that has three or four wives, that means that two or three other guys are going to go without. Alpha fucks and beta bucks is not a new phenomenon. It reaches all the way back to the very beginnings of our evolutionary history. This is why, based on numerous DNA studies, at a conservative estimate, twice as many women have passed on their genes compared to men. The so-called 80-20 rule is just the natural outcome that you'd expect. That's just tournament life, bro. The majority of females are trying to reproduce with a small number of genetically fit alphas, and the majority of beta males get squeezed out of the reproductive game altogether. Together. It is the exact same reproductive trend we observe in our close primate relatives like the lowland gorilla. This is the natural state of human beings in the wild, and here's the thing. This, my friends, is not a patriarchy, 
it's a matriarchy in disguise. I've heard this phenomenon referred to as the apex fallacy. It's essentially the same mistake that feminists make. They see that the overwhelming majority of CEOs are male, and from that one narrowly specific fact, they deduce that all men in society are doing better than all women in society. It never even crosses their minds that at the other end of the social spectrum from CEOs, men also make up the overwhelming majority of sewer workers and garbage collectors. They make up the majority of homeless people, suicide victims, murder victims, cancer deaths, drug addicts, workplace fatalities, and so on. We have, I think, made the same mistake of looking at the social structure of tournament species, including that of humans. We've focused on the top alphas, the most visible leaders, the Lion King who heads the pride with his glorious mane and deep male roar, and based on that alpha male in charge, we've deduced that all male lions hold authority over all female lions. We erroneously assumed on the basis of the solitary alpha lion that these social structures are patriarchal patriarchies, but they are not. It is not a patriarchy. Almost the exact opposite is true. It's a matriarchy. It's actually a social structure where females hold social authority over males, with the exception of a very, very small handful of alphas who hold authority over everyone. In a recent Dumpster Fire podcast I was part of, TFM even gave the example of a troop of wild baboons who were observed during the 1980s. The alpha males of this baboon troop ate some tainted food from a hotel dumpster and they all died. In the absence of any alpha males, this baboon troop instantly became matriarchal. None of the lesser males stepped up to fill the power vacuum and take the place of the missing alphas. They all just went full bonobo. And that should tell you everything you need to know. This troop of baboons didn't all magically transform into bonobos out of nowhere. That is how they always were. They were always secretly bonobo-like. We just weren't paying enough attention to notice. Tournament species are all effectively matriarchies where the majority of males are socially submissive and subservient betas to the females, except for a very small handful of alpha males who sit above everyone at the apex of the social hierarchy. You kill off the small handful of alphas at the top, and what's left over, the social order that you're left with, is bonobos. Even in a tournament species as highly sexually dimorphic as baboons. And if I am correct in this assessment, then this has some big implications on human social structure. What are we humans naturally inclined towards? And without the correct environmental pressures, is it even possible to go against this natural human inclination to any meaningful degree? The Industrial Revolution has led to a massive resource surplus, which in turn allowed for a widespread welfare state to form. Over the last century, many of the individual survival pressures that existed for most of our civilization's history have started to lift. If you can't pay your rent, don't even worry about it because you can just apply for a welfare check. In addition to this monetary welfare, mechanization also lowered the bar on physical workforce requirements, which previously represented something of a practical barrier to entry for would-be economically independent working women. And when these artificial economic survival pressures have lifted, what do we see? I would argue that we are starting to see a return back towards the natural or wild reproductive model of the human ape. The women are all out trying to fuck the top silverback alpha Chad Cox. We have a growing single motherhood epidemic where the next generation of children are effectively being collectively raised by the female half of society and it's all being collectively paid for through the tax dollars of beta male workers who collectively support society and benefit in terms of a group survival strategy but see little reproductive success themselves. This is no doubt a gross oversimplification of an incredibly complicated system. Nonetheless, I find the broad structural parallels more than a little interesting. 10,000 years later and we've come full circle right back to where we started as bipedal apes. 
Balancing male responsibility with male authority is a nice idea. I'm not opposed to it. I mean, it just makes sense. It makes logical sense that if you are responsible for something, you should hold authority over it. But as we know full well, logic is not the primary force driving our society. How do we logically reinstate this particular flavor of patriarchy if it turns out that matriarchy is in fact the default natural behavior of human social hierarchies? This reminds me of a quote in an old Barbarossa video, which he credited to Malcolm X, although I can't find the original source. He said that nobody hands you your freedom. You don't vote for it, you just take it. If you can't take your freedom, then you're not free. And I don't think that most men are capable of taking their freedom from women. By and large, most men just can't say no to women, even to their own wives in their own homes. It is just not a social behavior that the average blue pill man is biologically inclined towards. For better or worse, it appears that even in the absence of competition from other alphas, most males are just biologically destined to play out the role of subservient beta bonobo cuck to the collective interests of females. And if I'm correct about this tournament style matriarchy being the default natural state of human reproductive relationships and the subsequent social hierarchies which form around them, then I think there is really only two options available to the lone dissident red pill thinking man. The first option is to try and become one of the top alphas. Personally, I think this is unlikely to say the least. You would think that being alpha is as simple as being at the top of your game, standing out as a cut above the rest, and that may well have been the case in the days of the hunter-gatherer. However, modern women are not exactly known for their fair-minded rationality and objectivity. It remains to be seen exactly how being a cut above the rest is actually assessed by females today. 10,000 years ago, alpha males were probably the top 5 or 10 guys in a 50 to 60 person tribe. Back then, that's what women had to work with. Today, between traditional mass media and online social media, the size of our tribe has gotten a whole lot bigger. I understand that this will sound braggadocious to a lot of people, but there is a point to it. On paper, I am basically a 9 out of 10 in every category that matters for male relationship prospects. I am 6 foot 4, which puts me into the top 5% of men in terms of physical stature. With 70% of Australians being overweight or obese, that fact alone automatically puts me into the top 30% of men in terms of physical fitness. However, rather than resting on my laurels or my ass, on my days off work, I run five kilometers, I smash weights at the gym four nights a week, and I practice intermittent fasting. So at a reasonable guess, I am probably within the top third of this group as well, meaning the 90th percentile overall. I have an IQ of 126, which puts me into the 95th percentile for intelligence. I'm well read, I know a number of different programming languages, I, I do statistical analysis for fun, ju just for fun. I have a wide range of interests and hobbies, gardening, four-wheel driving, motorcycles, music, woodwork, art. I have a fairly good sense of humor, I dress well, and I mean, it is situationally dependent, but I would say that generally speaking, I'm a pretty confident guy. Financially, according to my last annual tax return, I am now in Australia's 90th percentile for individual income. I own my own house, I own a car, I own a motorcycle, which apart from its value as a material asset, is an attractive point of interest to women in its own right. Overall, I am doing extremely well for myself. On paper at least, I tick all the boxes, but I think most women who meet me wouldn't really categorize me as an alpha. The internet really has had a large impact, I think. As I said in a previous video, you used to be lucky just to catch a glimpse of the president during a motorcade parade. Today, however, you can pull out your iPhone and literally tweet at the real Donald Trump whenever you feel like. And I think the psychological impact of this internet connectivity has resulted in women now seeing many of these unattainable celebrity men as actually existing inside their direct social circle. 
and this can lead to some rather skewed perspectives. Don't get me wrong, I've had success with women. Even women with impossibly unreasonable standards will settle for what's directly available to them at the time, even if they are simply biding their time until they can monkey branch to a better option later. But I can easily imagine that there are a great, great many men out there who would literally score 10 out of 10 in every conceivable category that matters for relationship prospects who still wouldn't be considered an alpha male due to the impossibly skewed standards of modern women. For me, one of the most interesting and memorable moments reading The Game by Neil Strauss was when he was mistaken in a nightclub for being the alternative rock DJ Moby. When this happened, Strauss remarked how it dawned on him that no amount of artificial manufactured game, no amount of peacocking or negging or reframing could possibly compete with real honest-to-God celebrity status. That book was published in September 2005. 12 months later, Mark Zuckerberg's private university networking website, The Facebook, was made available to anybody in the general public with a valid email address. That celebrity status is now what you are directly competing against on social media platforms. Depending on who she is subscribed to, your Facebook posts will appear directly alongside Moby's Facebook posts in her personal newsfeed. Now, I'm not saying that you can't have reasonable success with women, that's not what I'm saying. But as far as trying to become alpha to cheat the algorithm of human social hierarchy, unless you are actually Moby or Elon Musk or Dwayne The Rock Johnson, I just don't think that truly becoming or being considered alpha is within the reach of most men today. Even men who literally have everything else going for them in life. And of course, this doesn't even address the fact that in this brave new world of Twitter hashtags, even the likes of Jeff Bezos and Kevin Spacey can be divorce raped to the tune of billions or me tooed out of a successful three decade movie career on the say so of anonymous internet randoms. Being alpha might attract male respect and female attention when things are going well, but being alpha ultimately offers no protection when things go wrong. So to the extent that you'd even call it an option, that's option one. The second option is to basically reject the whole damn system. Even with all the PUA tricks in the world, you are probably never going to be considered a real alpha. It's just a fact. That is just how it is. As Tism put it, if you're not famous by 14, you're finished. But that doesn't mean you have to settle for being a beta cuck provider either. You don't have to accept that fate. In fact, this whole alpha beta paradigm really only exists when men and women start looking at each other in terms of reproductive investment. Well, I colloquially say each other, but it's unilaterally women. Women are in control of sexual selection. They are the sexual filters of the species. Men approach women, men proposition women, and then women get to choose who reproduces and who doesn't. As Robert Briefo so eloquently summarized the situation, the female, not the male, determines all the conditions of the animal family. Where the female can derive no benefit from association with the male, no such association will take place. In other words, your status, your designation of alpha male or beta male within the human social hierarchy is determined entirely based on what women think of you. Your social worth as a man is being assessed based entirely upon women's fickle feelings. I thought the doxing of Roosh V was rather telling in this regard. The very same feminists who spent the better part of Roosh V's online career decrying his toxic masculinity instantly pulled a 180 and started slagging him out for being a loser man-child who still lives in his mummy's basement. The fact that feminists are giant hypocrites is largely unsurprising, but the inconsistency of their ideology here reveals what they are ultimately about. Feminism is female nature politicised. It doesn't have to be logically consistent, it just has to be pro-female and progress female interests. Regardless of whether they wear the label of feminist, they are still women, and what was really being communicated in the case of Roosh 
HV has nothing to do with equality or ethics or politics. It was a verbal warning signal to other reproductively fit women that this man is deemed to have low social value, low value or usefulness to women and should therefore be considered a sexual pariah. Even the most ardent feminists are quite happy to utilize the framework of so-called toxic masculinity, harmful gender stereotypes and sexual shaming language when it suits the advancement of collective female interests. Because ultimately, gender stereotypes and shaming language is the very framework that these women are biologically predisposed to. The fundamental role of females within the species is reproduction, and feminist or not, this stereotyping and sexual shaming is just the natural language that these women use to communicate to each other about the perceived reproductive and genetic fitness of the men around them. Any man who doesn't toe the line of female interest is designated a neckbeard, creeper, Asperger's, fedora, misogynist, sad, lonely, virgin, loser, incel, sexist, racist, woman hater. Even back in the days of old, they were called womanizers, cads, ruffians, blaggards, scoundrels. The real irony behind the modern outrage of so-called slut shaming is that women simply don't want their own tools of coercive sexual control used against them. Even TFM has said it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that he's a veteran. It doesn't matter that he's a net taxpayer. It doesn't matter that the cold hard facts are on his side. He fucks a life-size doll instead of a quote-unquote real woman, so everything he says is automatically invalidated in the eyes of most people. Your social value as a man is purely speculative, and that speculative value is driven by your association to women. It all comes down to how they choose to reproductively designate you. And I'm going to let you in on a little secret secret that perhaps nobody has ever told you as a man. You don't have to take that shit. You're only a beta if you choose to accept her terms. If some woman wants to treat me like a beta, that's great. She can fuck right off because I really don't need her in my life. I mean, really, what the fuck have women done in their lives that makes them think they can stare down their noses at us men? You guys all know the stats by now. You know what women as a demographic have actually contributed to our civilization. Sweet fuck all. Women don't build skyscrapers. They don't drive trucks or run farms. They don't dig coal out of the ground or cook in restaurants or manufacture goods. They don't develop new software or technology. They don't do jack shit. They sit on their fat asses and complain about sexism while their male workhorse provider is out there earning spending money for them and keeping society afloat. And then they have the gall to turn around and cry, where have all the good men gone? On. These sassy, sophisticated, solvent women say they are struggling to find other halves that can measure up. This is the same fucking gender who are all currently rushing to the Dutch divorce courts this December, trying to beat the January 1st deadline for a new law which would see their alimony payments in the Netherlands reduced from 12 years down to only 5 years. Don't miss out. Get in quick while this special Christmas offer still lasts. I mean, how fucking dare these useless social parasites judge that the male demographic, the gender who built the internet and landed our species on the moon are somehow beneath them and don't measure up to their insane, unreasonable standards. Men, the dynamo that drives society, are somehow at fault. Right, where have all the good men gone? As if dating services like Tinder aren't overrun with swaths of second-rate single mothers who apparently think so highly of themselves, they will straight up tell you in their about section, don't even bother messaging me if you're shorter than six foot three. Is there any wonder that some men today find Japanese cartoon characters more attractive than the real women they have to deal with? Fuck them. Fuck them and their entitled nonsense. I expect that this is exactly what TFM means when he says, take women's rights away. You don't ask for it, you don't vote for it, you just do it. Now, that doesn't mean trying to control women. MGTOW has never been about controlling women. It's about not being controlled by women, which is the state that 
most men just seem biologically predisposed to. Ultimately, the only power that these women have over us is the power that we choose to give them and we can stop any time we want. Feminist writer Margaret Atwood once claimed that women are afraid men will kill them, men are afraid that women will laugh at them. Well, laugh back. If you see some shallow, entitled bitch crying, where have all the good men gone? Or carrying on about, if you can't handle me at my worst, then you don't deserve me at my best. Just laugh straight in her fucking face and walk away. Is that going to change the world? Is it going to change the misandric laws or the suicide rate? No, but it sure does feel good, doesn't it? It sure does feel fucking great to know that you don't have to accept reality on her insane female terms. If you reject her shitty worldview, her reality of female perfection and male disposability, if you don't accept her stupid alpha beta bullshit, then she has zero control over you. You're a free man. Men are afraid that women will laugh at them? Good. Let women laugh all they want, because if that's the worst that can happen, if that's the price of freedom, then the joke is ultimately on them.